before. <coughs> uh, he was Rod Coe's PR man. And he used to write articles in some of the Solville publications back then. And, uh, and a bunch of stuff that Cal brought last year, uh, he had a list of the top 20 New England racers that he considered good enough to race for anybody. Factory teams, they were, they were the, the top races what he considered in New England at that time. And uh, they are Cal Reynolds, Paula Montaigne, Keith Thompson, Keith Lowell, Bruce Bryant, Bruce Dunham, Bob Martin, Fred Felton, Dick Manning, Tom Blackburn, Bob Cully, Harry Clark, Joe Wilkinson, Ronnie Wormat, Tony Consolini, Dave Picard, Alan Ames, Bob Fortin, Dennis Kowaleski, and Don Fowler. Of some of those guys I hadn't heard of before, but many of them I had. I added J.R. Tozier and Conrad Rollins. He did say that these, you know, that everybody's got a top 20, and I had to add J.R. and Conrad. Uh, and speaking of Conrad, uh, Vicky, apparently Vicky couldn't make it today. Um, but Conrad was more than just a, a top snowmobile racer back then. When we attended his funeral, I stood up and about three or four other people stood up and we talked, uh, you know, about racing and uh, we had some racing stories about Conrad. But then one gentleman stood up and he said, uh, that he and Conrad used to go riding a lot, trail riding. And I can imagine what it would be like to be trail riding with Conrad now. <laughs> um, and he, this gentleman, uh, every time he'd leave the house, his kids would beg him to take them along. And he finally says, I, I got courage enough to ask Conrad if it was okay if I took my two young kids along with us on one of our rides. And Conrad said, yes, absolutely. And he said, Conrad Rollins made my kids feel like we were on that ride just for them. That's the kind of guy that he was. So just to, just to let you know, Um, this uh, sign up here, I found this sign down, uh, my wife and I went to Hobby <laughs> and uh, I came back and I told her, I said, I wish we had bought that sign, but instead I made one up. It says, be so good, they can never forget you. Be so good that they can never forget you. And uh, I have a story here that Rick Simula uh, brought brought up to me uh, about a week ago, and he wanted to know if I could uh, read this. He said it's uh, it's for those guys that race the big stuff. And uh, would you read that for me? Because he had prior engagements, he had to. Uh, is a fishing derby down in uh, Winnipesaukee, and uh, they did that every year, and he's got some friends that wanted him to go, so unfortunately he couldn't make it, but he did want this story read. Hang on to that up there while I, while I read this story. Uh, it's Rick Simula, by memory of the men who rode the fastest snowmobiles in the world. The time was 1972, I was 17 years old and had been racing a 1972 250 EXT Yardicat in A stock at Lawston, Maine, grabbing second place behind George Plucky Jr. and barely edging out Ray Resnick, who came in third. We had been running in the top three points all year, but most racing fans will not remember us because
because we were racing in the lower horsepower classes. At around 7 p.m., with the lowest in raceway now on the lights, I had my second place money, a bushel full of AC spark plugs, my AC contingency check, and stickers, so we all decided to load our sleds in gear. When the final race of the night was announced, my cousin Gary and I are in the parking lot at the far end of the enclosed grandstand. We would not have been able to get back to the infield on time. The biggest race of the weekend was about to start when Gary looked up at the snowbank between turns one and two and says, let's go. We climbed over the chain link fence, got tangled up in the second snow fence, but finally made it into the darker section, smack dab in the middle of turns one and two. Now both of us, we knew we weren't supposed to be there. Did I mention we were 17? <laughs> Just then the sharp, high-pitched sound of two pipes arose from the infield, and out onto the track they came. Ten of New England Snowfield Racing's greatest stars pulled to the line, and right there in the middle was Cal Reynolds on his big 72 blizzard. Joe Wilkinson was on a blizzard to his right. Out of the 10 sleds, six or seven were the wide chassis screw blizzards. This was the Mod 5 final, the 800s, and the big boys were about ready to put on a show. They bounced up and down a few times to set the studs, but just before Ted Wynott was about to wave the green flag, Cal Reynolds stood straight up on his running board, adjusted his legendary blue scar, <laughs> and I swear, the man looked ten feet tall. He towered over the rest. Then Cal settled in, the green flag dropped, and boom! Twenty skis lifted off the ground at the same time. Thirty alcohol-fueled cylinders roared to life. With each three-cylinder engine developing a hundred horsepower, it created the sound of a thousand horsepower. And all of it was coming our way fast. It was common knowledge back then that those big 615-800 cc powered machines never liked to turn. It was akin to trying to turn left with a top fuel funny car at the end of a quarter mile without a parachute. <laughs> Only now at 10 funny cars, trying to turn left and all flying for the same piece of racetrack. But these winter warriors manhandled those monsters through the turns one and two without incident. They opened them up full throttle and drag raced up the backstretch, barreling into turns three and four, bouncing, flying, crashing, and clawing their way around, then opening them up again for the front stretch. This went on for ten very cold, grueling laps. The pungent scent of racing fuel hung in the air like a thick fog. Each time they rolled high into turns one and two, we were peppered with stinging pieces of ice and snow. We'd pull our knit hats down and peer through the stretched yarn as to not miss a single second of the greatest race our young lives had ever witnessed. Now I raced snowmobiles during the golden age of snowmobile racing, just like those men did, and there were many of us who raced in the smaller horsepower classes, but there are only a handful of drivers who were daring enough, brave enough, to compete on those awesome 650s and 800s. So I'd like to finish this story by thanking Calvin Reynolds, Joe Wilkinson, Bruce Dunham, Bob Martin, Conrad Rollins, Lewis Lund, and all of those fearless few, the ones who sold the tickets. And yes, the ones who made the kind of memories that will last a boy a lifetime.
1968 aboard a family skidoo. In one first two races, he entered. He raced until 1977. Won no less than a first, second, or third place finish in all races entered during the entire 1970 season in the 295 class. Won no less than a first, second, or third place finish in all races entered during the entire 1973 USSA season in A&P Star. Won no less than a first, second, or third place finish in all races entered during the entire 1974 USSA season in A&P Star. Was USSA Eastern Point leader in both A&P Star for 1973 and 1974. Grace Methanol Field 1971 Articat 440 to many victories, including three classes at the Manchester Winter Carnival. Won A star at the USSA World Series in Malone, New York in 1973 and took a fourth place in B star. He has taken home over 120 trophies in nine years of racing. Won the Pennsylvania Governor's Cup and the Paul Bunyan's Cup and Bruce also won the 1975 Kilkenny Cup in Mod 4. I Good 
afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to say thank you for coming today. A special thanks to my wife, Joyce, <laughs> twin daughter, Joan and Jim, my son, uh, Leonard, along with my eight grandchildren and two great grandkids, Aurora and Andrew, two little diamonds. And also thanks to Paul Brandon. Paul Gray <laughs> and Midge wrote for, for all they have done. I'm going to get settled in here in a minute. To promote snowmobiling and for recognizing us snowmobilers. I just want to thank you too so much. It's just uh, without you doing this, uh, we'd be still in the closet somewhere. <laughs> 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 Thank uh, Bob Clark, our race director, for all of his guidance. He really do. Uh, and for keeping us on the straight and narrow, or at least trying to. I couldn't forget our great friend and com competitor, Conrad Rollins, who passed recently. He also supported anyone who needed help. His shop doors were always open to any team or individual. He was a true professional racer. It was an honor to compete with him, and I know his spirit is with us all. He's right here today. You can't see him. He's right here. Um, it's, it's been a privilege to have raced with so many good guys. A special thanks uh, to uh, the two competitors, Gerald Merrill and uh, his wife, Joni, and uh, Nelson Taylor and his wife, Sheila, who raced uh, on, actually ran on the team through my class and stuff. So written with us uh, all the time. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Bill Kane. I wouldn't have this little. <laughs> Let me tell you this story. Uh, if anyone knew my dad, everything leads to a story. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I got invited uh, to do the racing, or uh, racing for Dick Wilkie, just a little private here in Harvard, Mass. And I'm uh, doing mostly drag racing then. And uh, I won a few races, I guess, and had a little bit of good luck. So I got a call from Harrington King who wanted to know if uh, I was a race for, uh, he was a distributor for players, through, for them through the uh, back by the factory. So uh, he wanted me to come down and meet with him. So, uh, you know, when a guy is young, I guess uh, he gets uh, a little cocky and stuff. <laughs> Uh, maybe I was. So anyway, uh, you know, this is talking told us what they would do and the support I was getting and stuff. And I said, so when I was walking out the door, I turned around and said, I'll tell you something, if I race for you, and you're Mr. Bill King, I want to be called Lewis the King. I win some races. <laughs> Jim and Alicia, they'll be uh, watching this from a distance, and I missed you today. So I, wanted, I told them I would uh, say that, so they thought they had to be somewhere else. I always felt at home when I came to Lancaster. Uh, anyone who knew Mr. Monaghan's shop, <laughs> the shop was always open to our team. They uh, invited us in. Oh, God. So, we made some good friends. Yeah, we thank you. And then a little bit of nostalgia. At a race held in 1971, I won't say where, New Hampshire, I got a little aggressive. I think for the first and only time that I could get. <laughs> and according to my recollection, I owe an apology to a gentleman. It seems that I bumped Carol Reynolds' sled. And imagine, I still get about it. <laughs> it was all in fun, really. 
now one of the great competitors, seriously, added a lot to the sport, and he's a class act. Stand up, gentlemen. <laughs> Sportsman 
both in the same year, covering all three divisions by the prestigious USSA race committee members, best driver and best sportsman. His Reynolds rating greatest team is best remembered for competing on such impeccably prepared machines. It helped to elevate the entire sport of New England snowmobile racing to a higher level. This is probably, this is the best photo. Cal, let me tell you something about Cal Reynolds. <laughs> Cal came in with a file box <laughs> full, full, of, uh, full of memories, memories. And for every memory he had of himself, there were three or four memories of his friends and competitors like, like uh, Conrad and Bruce Dunham. Uh, I had a hard time finding stuff on Cal. And uh, the best photo that we could come up with and, and all that stuff, and one that I wanted because it said Reynolds Raiders, is the only one that said Reynolds Raiders on his, on his jacket. And uh, fortunately, it, it came out of a, an old newspaper clipping. And my wife brilliantly uh, I mean, it was a yellow, a yellow uh, uh, newspaper clipping. So she did a very good job with that. If Cal wants to come up with a better photo, <laughs> put it in. But uh, I tell you, this is what we saw. Every Monday morning newspaper. This is what we saw. So, uh, and I want to go back to. The uh, the part where he where he won second place at the 1971 Grand Prix. Uh, I tell you who won it. it was another beater. His name was uh, Conrad Rollins. Now I can tell uh, Bob Martin can tell you just how bad the 71 blizzards were. <laughs> yeah, the, the 71 blizzard had a 27 inch ski stand and the, and the three cylinder engines were wider than the ski stands. Not only that, the engine sat up on top of the tunnel. It was, uh, it was top heavy, it was narrow, and honestly, Cal was competing against most of the major factory teams at that Grand Prix. And to come in second on that sled says a lot about his driving ability. Because Polaris clearly had a better sled that year. They were they had a 34 and a half inch ski stand. The engine sat low uh, down in the tunnel. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Cal Cal did very well to come in second place.
And Tom rode the inside rail. And I'm telling you, every time I come off that bank, I'd be in the middle of it. I'd look down like that and they go, Tom. I'd, 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 I'd got to be going a lot faster than that. And I'd just come off the bank and hit the ground. And up the back, I'd start going into the corner. And up on the bank, and again, I looked down, and there's Tom. <laughs> if everybody remembers the movie, uh, Bush catching and some damn kids when they had the rangers chasing them. They said, Who is that guy? Who is that guy? Who is that guy? Who is that guy? I kept looking down to Who is that guy? <laughs> but anyway, it was a great ride. I had a lot of fun. I met the, the best part of it is when you're pulling the pits and the camaraderie. The camaraderie, that's where it's at. Between Bruce, Louie, all the boys, especially that one over there that you just make a burn all the time. Everybody <laughs> <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. The camaraderie was, we spent all day with each other, all day long, every race weekend. They were band so, brothers. But I couldn't have ever done it without my beautiful wife, 59 years. <laughs> success 
of the 2014 50th Lancaster Grand Prix reunion race. He brought his entire staff, all working pro bono for this and every Grand Prix since.
If you want information about it, I've got these business cards. I'm happy to give you one. It's got my web address on it. And lastly, you guys may be familiar with me. If you're not already, uh, I host the largest vintage snowmobile themed page on Facebook, Vintage Snowmobile Lovers. It's the largest community of vintage snowmobile lovers anywhere, Facebook or otherwise. Uh, if you have a chance, jump on and join in the fun. It's, it's a very active page. So it's August 11th, Fairview Line, Vermont, Vintage Show and Swap. in, the, in the, this area, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Raced all the way to Wisconsin, the World Series out there, raced in Iowa and Michigan, raced in Pennsylvania. Uh, started out with just single cylinder, five horsepower machines and worked my way up to 640s and 800s. And my claim to fame, I guess, is I was beat by just about everybody in the business. I've been beat by the best, but I also won a few. So it, uh, it was a great experience and the camaraderie and the, the adventure and the time. Everything was the right time, the right place, the right time. And we were kind of pioneers back then. 
And uh, every weekend was a blast all went along. And uh, I wouldn't take anything from the memories. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Lewis Lunn. Uh, I've uh, started racing snowmobiles in the late 60s uh, uh, through uh, 73. Uh, race started racing for Polaris, small dealership uh, in Harvard, Mass, and doing mostly drag racing got me into it, and got invited to uh, go uh, race uh, full sleds uh, on the circuit, and uh, that we did. That I had a great time at. I had some some success. Nice. And, uh, made a lot of good relationships. Uh, was felt very very fortunate uh, in my racing career. I only got uh, off the sleds two different times in the, in the five years that I raced. And uh, one time uh, at Wolfboro, New Hampshire, uh, the sled had upset and uh, I couldn't clear it. Hit that and got a little bit of a concussion, but. Oh. I, didn't, I don't know if it still lasted today or not. I think <laughs> yeah. I'm over. It was probably, what, 40 years ago. Yeah. I think that I'm rang over. your bell pretty good, did yeah, it? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't terribly bad, but enough that uh, I didn't know right where I was or why I was there for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, other than that, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, been, uh, been very good. Uh, had some uh, really great people, great mechanic uh, who... Because we had good success with our, I raced uh, only 650s in the two classes. I raced my 650 in the 800 class and, and uh, fortunately had good success there. Uh, my mechanic was very sharp and uh, good. Uh, you know, he, he, got, he got everything that was in the sled. Nice. So, uh, we were able to put it all on the track. Yeah, uh, put, it, put it all on the track. And so that, that was good. Uh, we had a great uh, with Chaparral. I went from Polaris to Chaparral uh, because of distributor uh, changing. Uh, it wasn't anything to do with Polaris or the sleds, but the sure. distributor had changed and they wanted me to go uh, to Mitalka in New York uh, and stay with Polaris, but it would have been all down around New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and that. And just, you know, at the time, you know, I'm 77 and I'm still in my own business. I'm still working. Wow, well, good. So, uh, you know, I, it just would have been too much traveling for me. So uh, I was invited to stay with the distributor and, and Chaparral. And that was a great experience. Got out, uh, got out west, got to see some well, different things. we have done some uh, testing for them on the new IFS uh, independent front suspension sleds. And uh, Paul Bianca, the open wheel racer, which the picture showed, uh, I got a personal chance to meet with him and chat with him. And so, uh, you know, for I guess a young whippersnapper, yeah. you know, it was uh, pretty fortunate, I thought, you know. Nice. And made some good relationships there. Uh, we had a close relationship with the Nickerson. Uh, Gary Nickerson, uh, who run the New York uh, division for uh, Chaparral yep. Racing, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, had a good friendship and stuff, uh, working uh, back and forth with them, information, passing information and things. So, uh, other than that, you know, uh, a lot of, well, just uh, the second thing that happened to me on the track, it was up, I think it was Newport, uh, Vermont, we were racing, and I had just, the Chaparral, it was early in the season, it might have been second or third race on the Chaparral, and uh, we had done some qualifying, and I, I don't know if we was in a qualifying run or a final, but uh, I come out of uh, the second turn, and uh, on my left eye, I noticed something, uh, Moving like this, I looked down, and my ski was broadside. Oh. It wasn't forward; it was broadside. It and flipped I, around, and I was coming out of the turn with full power on, so my skis were off the ground. Fortunately, <laughs> so I knew what was going to happen. And uh, so what I did was I stood up, let off of the throttle, and jumped at the same time. Well, I cleared the sled. The sled pitch pole end over end. I don't know how many times. 
and I never went off my feet. I landed on my feet, and they said I was doing steps at about 25 feet each, <laughs> yeah. and about uh, probably 40, 50 miles an hour when I lit <laughs> on the track. Good God. So it, uh, it uh, got a rise out of the crowd. Uh, that would be something to see. <laughs> it, it was. Uh, everyone said uh, it was uh, kind of a comical act in a way, but yet, uh, you know, so... Uh, I was, like I said, uh, as far as being on the track with accidents and that was very, very close. The, uh, and then the only other bump I had, which I mentioned before, was the Carol Reynolds and I. And, uh, <laughs> that was a good story. And, uh, yeah, hey, uh, I, give him a, I give him a point of bump. Uh, I guess uh, uh, I was probably about as aggressive as a guy could be. Yeah. Uh, and I guess if you're going to win, you know, can't sit back and think about it. You got to get out front and get it done. Yeah, you don't go there to lose, right? No, no, no. We didn't. <laughs> we didn't go to lose. And, uh, but knowing uh, at the time, you know, we were doing having a great time doing, and never thought anything about a uh, hall of fame or being the name on the wall of the museum or something. You know, sure. Never, you know, I just thought we were doing that someday. Be all done of it. I might look at some of my back at some of my old things. I never thought that we would have this happen. But, uh, you know, so yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, that it's still kept it, alive. It really is. Uh, Midge and uh, Midge and Paul, uh, and just what they're doing here, you know, and and and, and others. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the stop yourself and and all that. Uh, you know, bringing back. And I think uh, this snowmobilers and, and even people that might not be much in snowmobiling kind of say gosh that'd probably be half interesting you know <laughs> yeah. and uh, so probably there were some interesting characters sure <laughs> involved in it so yeah other than that uh you know i guess uh that's my uh, that's my story and i'm sticking to it sticking to it nice Right. Oh, one final thought. Um, what are, do you have any memories or thoughts about those early IFS sleds? You were the one that was that uh, tested some of those first first well, iterations of that, right? Yeah, yeah. They uh, they were uh, they were so much quicker. You know, the, the suspension, the independent suspension. I had it the first year before anyone else had it, and uh, not not. I don't know if you want to brag about it or not, but I guess I've heard it said that. If it happened and you can do it, you're not bragging about it. Sure. But uh, I I had seen you know, some movies that were taken, uh, you know, when we were racing, and like uh, when when I had that IFS the chaparral, uh, like uh, the race would start and we come out of the second turn and and uh, and around the corner and I'd be halfway down the back stretch and they're just coming out, and, you know, if uh, if you had like a quarter or half mile track. Within three to five laps, I'd be laughing everybody in the sled, which is wow. tremendous, tremendous. And corner, must corner 100% better, I would oh, think. Oh, God, just, you know, I never hardly had to let off the throttle. You know? So even then, in the with the first early um, experiments with that suspension, you knew that was the future of snowmobiling? Oh, gosh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Absolutely was, you know. And, uh, well, they all went to it, so it wasn't, sure, it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't a mistake, that's for sure, Yeah. You know? And it was a, it was a way that all of all every every factory you know followed suit there sure somewhat and I imagine the whole industry took notice of that when they started coming out coming out with the IFS sleds oh yeah I absolutely did they yeah. knew that was everyone yeah. knew that was the future yeah. oh yeah. yeah good very good. very very much so good yeah. well thank you Lewis I really appreciate it oh thank you my name is Tom Peters uh, from Presque Isle Maine now born and brought up in Stockholm Maine. Uh, raced from the mid 60s, 66 actually, through 76. Uh, raced basically uh, Bombardier, or Skidoo, Blizzards, uh, owned five different models of them, and uh, primarily in the 650 class, 640 and 650 class. Uh, raced a lot of, didn't, didn't race down here with the big guys a lot. Raced if there was local races, we used to try to hit them because. Made a lot of travel from Worcester County down, but it did race in Scarborough, Lewiston, uh, Bangor quite a few times. So it did cover the whole state. Uh, yeah. Never, never did come into New Hampshire to race. It was, yeah. it was just uh, too far back in the day. But sure. Uh, we. Uh, I was telling some of the guys there today. The, 
guys that were there, I said, you know, we we got up in the morning Monday morning and we looked at our we looked at the uh, newspaper or looked at the race results for the weekend and there was your name, you know, if you were fortunate enough to win, there was your name. But I said, you know, that didn't happen in a bubble. <laughs> there was all kinds of people behind the scenes that made that happen, but sure. I, I get race results and stuff in here. You go down through those race results, those people's names aren't there. You well, know, our our names are there, but sure. You know, it was it wasn't a it wasn't a one man deal. You know, it was a, a lot of people made that happen. A lot of people to make it happen. It was uh, it was quite a thing. So I really did. in one of the memorable events, and Cal Reynolds and I talked about it today. We we raced in Bangor, 1970. I pulled into Bangor with a car with a homemade trailer with a 1970 Blizzard on the back end of it, well, and here's all these tractor trailers and factory all these teams. race factory teams out there. And I told the guy that I was with, I, I said, they own the Skidoo dealership. I said, I can't race here. He said, What are you talking about? I said, Look at what they got. I said, Here I am with a homemade trailer and a sled on it. And I said, You expect me to go out and compete against that? And he said. Look, young man, he said, you put your pants on one leg at a time, just like they do. He said, you go out there, and he said, you can beat them all. So I went out on Saturday, did not qualify. So uh, Sunday, they had a uh, consolation race, and I won that consolation race by, we found some traction equipment overnight yeah. and worked till about 1 o'clock in the morning to get it on there. So I won the first heat, there was three heats, qualifying heats, and I won every one of them by about a quarter of a lap. Really? So everybody was watching then. This guy didn't qualify yesterday, and so I got into the final. Cal Reynolds was in the final. Yeah. And uh, I pushed him quite hard. He beat me by about half a ski lane. Wow. And uh, he was telling me today, he said that they, they threw that chassis away because he couldn't ride on the track. I rode the rail, and he was trying to ride on the bank. And he said yeah. they had to throw that chassis away. He said there wasn't a rivet that was left tight in it. He they said, loosened it all up. Loosened it all up. He <laughs> said, I found it so hard. He said, and I don't know if you heard him say today, he was up on the bank, he looked down, and there was, <laughs> yeah. there was Tom Peters sitting on the inside rail. So it was, a, there, that, that's one of the real good memories, you know, yeah. racing against people like that. So That's awesome. Uh, but it's, it's been, uh, it was a wonderful ride, you know, but, you know, 50 years later, there's a lot of good memories. Yeah, it's nice that it's still remembered today, too. Yep. That yep. means a lot, and yeah. Uh, and they're going to, I talked to Midge there, and they're going to put me in in the 2020 good. category here. So. Good. 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 Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. All right. My name is Paul Lamontang, and I'm down here uh, for this wonderful event. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you right now, these guys have just got the award, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, really, really deserve it. It's, uh, it's amazing, and it's nice to see them again. And... Everybody just, you know, all the old memories come back. What you've done, who you were with. You can even pinpoint a time, a certain lap, and we got talking about things. It's fantastic. And uh, I was very fortunate to race from 1969 to 75 and uh, with different teams and different sleds. And uh, we started with Rupp and went on, went on to uh, Chaparral's. And after that, finally finished my racing with Mercury out of on like Wisconsin and with snow twisters and, and just had a great time uh, and meeting great people and, and I'm glad that uh, this vintage racing is, is coming back because I'll tell you right now there was people the young people just will never have the, uh, the opportunity to do and see what we did and by doing this uh, it gives everybody a chance even if if you pick up an old machine and and get on it and have a good time and good laughs, uh, there's really nothing like it. So I, I appreciate everything uh, they know that's been done and people that, the way they treated me and, uh, and the best everybody. Nice. Any any favorite memories of, of of racing back in the day, back in the 70s? Oh my God, uh, <laughs> there was there was some like uh, I was racing against Gilles Villeneuve up in Bangor and he had me by about a half a lap. And it took me 10 laps, and I caught him on the last corner to win a, the modified class. And to, this day, to that day, him and I were friends. We were together. Uh, I also raced against him in Boonville, New York. I also raced against him at Eagle River, where him and I fought for first and second. And he ended up, uh, I got him in Bangor, and he got me. And it, it was just fun things like this that happened. It's just amazing, amazing, amazing. 
and of also the guys like Brad Holland who, who went on to race for, for uh, Polaris. Uh, him and I, we bumped heads for a whole winter on our Mercury Snow Twisters, and we had so much fun just beating up on each other, really. And and uh, it's things that we'll never we'll never forget. Wonderful. But uh, I want to I want to thank you for you know interviewing me, and I hope you people get the get the get to get into the to the sport. And as I'm 69 years old, listen to this, I still ride still every ride. weekend. Nice. In the last 22 years. I'm to be found in Jackman, Maine, or up in Canada, and just having a ball riding. Right now, what I do now, I, I got rid of all the fast sleds in, two, in 2012, and now I got myself a nice view of touring, 1200, skidoo, and nice. tour around with my fiance, and we're all over the place, and we just have a ball. We just have a ball, so there's no end. I mean, you can be 85 and still out there running and having a great time, and and every weekend when we pull into Jackman, everybody looks forward to see each other and, and I'm with friends like Wilkinson out there that I used to race years ago and we just have a ball every weekend so life's too short we gotta enjoy every minute wonderful thank you so much Paul it was nice to meet you thank you very very much At the end of this video, we'll take a look at Mad Ramp's innovative pivoting ramp system, the safer, easier way to transport your ATVs and snowmobiles. Stick around. Before we begin, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our friends at the historic Lancaster Motel in Lancaster, New Hampshire. The Lancaster Motel has been serving snowmobilers since the 60s and they are the perfect eastern trail riding destination for snowmobilers young and old. The Lancaster Motel is right on Corridor Trail 5 in Lancaster, New Hampshire with plenty of parking for vehicles, sleds and trailers. Plus, the Lancaster Motel is within walking distance of Crane's Snowmobile Museum plus restaurants, shopping, entertainment and more. Click the link in the description to learn more about the Lancaster Motel. Good evening and welcome to the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. I'm really glad you're here tonight. I'd like to thank you for joining us. We have a full lineup of Vintage Snowmobile Entertainment tonight. We've got some live guests uh, live guests standing by to come on for some show and tell here in just a couple of minutes. We also have some... Uh, uh, we've got a, a snowmobile for sale, and we've got the induction into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame in 2019. Claude Hebert is going to be the inductee. And then last but not least, we have Steve Dickinson's Vintage Articat Snowmobiles. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure that everything is working properly. So um, if, you're, if you can see my face and hear my voice, I'm going to ask you to make a comment. Let me know where you're viewing this from. And if you're a first-time viewer, let me know if you're a first-time viewer. And uh, if you're a regular viewer, uh, let me know if you're a regular viewer. And to both of you, I thank you very much. If you're a first-time viewer, thanks for coming on to give us a, a look. Hope you like what you see and decide to join us every week. And if you're a regular viewer, I thank you so much for coming on and joining us every week. It really means a lot. And this is a great way to grow this podcast. Now, if you're enjoying this, whether you're a first time or a regular viewer, I'm going to ask you a favor to help spread the word about this. If you could share this on your profile or share it on a friend's profile who you think might enjoy this, or maybe even share it with them in a private message, that would really do a lot to help spread the word about this podcast. Now, let's take a look at uh, who's watching tonight. We've got Brian Robillard. He is a regular viewer, and he's been on here as a guest, and I've been talking with him behind the scenes. He's got some other sleds uh, that he's ready to show us, hopefully in another week or two. So uh, uh, we've got big expectations of uh, what Brian Robillard has to show us. We also have Scott Verdon from Michigan. I know he's a regular viewer as well. Thanks for coming on, Scott. Uh, George Zandbelt from Winchester, Ontario. Thanks for coming on, George. 
uh, George is a regular viewer as well, and so is John Spranger Jr. He likes the pro the podcast, and he thinks the snow is still on back order. Yeah, it is here as well. If you're in the Northeast, uh, yeah, we're getting skunked on the snow. We've been getting a little bit, just an inch or two here and there, but hardly enough for some decent trail riding. Also, John Greenwood, thanks for coming on, John. Appreciate you coming on. Ken Haberman, thank you, Ken. I just spoke with Ken the other day. I appreciate you coming on to check it out. We have Brody Messner from Henderson, Minnesota. Brody's a regular viewer as well. Uh, Tracy Dudley Skipinski, howdy from Michigan. Uh, Tracy and Dudley are, are regular viewers. Um, we've got Jamie Whitaker, first time viewer from Williamsburg, Ontario. Thank you for thank you for coming on, Jamie. We really appreciate it, and we hope that we let we hope that you like what you see. I'm sorry, my tongue is in a knot tonight, uh, but hopefully that'll get untied and we'll be able to have a great show here. Tom Gregory, regular viewer, thanks for coming on, uh, Tom from Armada, Michigan. Uh, Ryan Chase, first time viewer from Concord, Vermont, just down the road. I'm up in Derby Line. Thanks for coming on, Ryan. And then we've got. Joe Jake Co. Sr. from Canada High Arctic Northwest Territory. And we've got Mike Orr in Ontario. Great. This is great, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm not going to keep Joe Roscoe waiting any longer. Let's bring him on to the podcast and turn his mic on. How you doing, Joe? Good evening, uh, Mike. Good. Well, good. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Uh, now, Joe is on here from Ontario, and he's at his family dealership, his Ski-Doo dealership. He's got some incredible show and tell that he's going to be sharing with us tonight. I'm going to put a banner up on the screen here. This is the name of his dealership, and uh, in a second here, he's going to turn his camera around uh, and, and talk up what uh, what he's got going on there. And I'm going to remove this from the screen. There we go. Yeah, he's turning his camera around right now. Yeah, wait till you see, guys, what he's got to show us. This is going to be great. We'll go right to the gas tanks first, though, Mike. Uh, Mike? Yes, by all means. Okay, I noticed when you had it on, it was Joe's gas tank. It's not Joe's. It's Joe, Joe and Mike's, or Mike and Joe's, or Mike Orr is online. He's... Uh, really the biggest contributor mike's done all the work i just give him the work to do so gotcha uh, okay but i'm uh, glad you mike, cleared that up oh yeah no mike does a fantastic job he does, he's a perfectionist so actually ken's online this is one of ken's tanks the moto skis ken ken's invested quite a bit in it and mike did the tank for ken and it's perfect to a t if you notice yeah that's nice then uh in the middle here is the blizzard bubble nose tank and it's an exact uh, fit part numbers and all and uh right here is the 72 blizzard tank um, if you look real close, I don't know if you can see it, you'll see the part number uh, right, right, right in it. So yes. Th these tanks are an exact fit, better than, better than the new ones, better plastic, and Mike is a perfectionist, so you can guarantee that uh, you know, they're perfect to a T. One other thing Mike's done for me is uh, the head. That's a 70 Blizzard uh, uh, 340 uh, for the bubble nose. That's the head, and he's currently working on a cylinder as we speak. Um, Wonderful. What Mike is also working on, we've got a, a 71 wide body blizzard tank and Mike uh, probably, I hope his uh, iPad doesn't blow up right now, but I, we're trying to have it ready by the uh, end of February. So hopefully that'll be out. Uh, so um, with Ken, Ken's got different uh, vintage motor ski parts too. He's got chain cases, uh, trunks, belt covers. So if you need anything, get in touch with Ken at Ken's re rehab.com, I believe it is. And uh, you'll be able to get motor ski parts for the nice. tank. For the tanks, you can get in touch with uh, my son at the store here, or uh, Goose is going to be selling them uh, in the U.S. Um, so Go Goose in the U.S., that's Ken, uh, or Ron Thompson, and uh, he's looking after U.S. sales for us. Nice. And Ken and Mike are both in the comments right now, so if you are curious about these tanks and want to reach out to either of them, uh, just contact them um, in the comments there and, and, uh, and get a conversation started. But uh, yeah, this is great, Joe. Go ahead. Please continue. Yes, so I'll show a, try and give different views so that uh, everyone can see. So we're hoping to uh, move these tanks. Uh, basically, what people have to understand is uh, shipping. We can do nothing about shipping. Shipping's expensive. Can't do anything about it. And right now, we're, we're really not <laughs> making money. We would just like to break even. The, the, the cost of the mold is very considerable. So sure. it's really just the hobby and to get things done. Gotcha. Now, John Fitzgibbons is watching, and he's wondering who he might contact in the U.S. Uh, to get some of these tanks. I know you mentioned Goose is your U.S. contact. Is there a phone number or something for him? Um, yes, I'd have to post it. I don't know it off uh, uh, heart, but I will post it for everyone. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, also, if someone is curious, too, you can email me after the, after the program, and I'll, I'll, uh, uh, Joe will share that information with me, and I can relay that to you. And also, as you can see here, Ken Haberman is on, and uh, he's, he's got his contact information there. You can find him in the comments of this video um, if you'd like to reach out to him. But uh, yeah, please, please tell us about this citation. That's a 1980 uh, Citation SS. It's uh, pretty well perfect. It's uh, not the one uh, we had as new, but my wife had one exactly. We bought it the first new sled we ever bought. And... Uh, so, you know, it was one of the favorites I wanted to pick up and finally did. And 
And so with, I got it now on display. Then yeah, I, got, I remember those when they came out. I was a teenager and I was madly in love with those. I'll just take a walk around. I've got a Please few do. more. Uh, all the, these are kind of some of the ones I have, just special ones I put on display for everyone to see in the store. I like that RV. Yeah, they're, uh, they, they were a little bit hard to find sometimes, but I've got a couple of them actually. Yeah, and tell me about that racing sled if you would. Do you mind going back for a second? Uh, which one? That one right there in the center of the screen. Okay, that one actually originated from Kirkland Lake. It was, oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah, it, it was bought. It came out of Barrie. Uh, the fellow was my age. Uh, he bought it brand new for, I think, $5,500. And uh, he raced it, and then it ended up in different places, and I got it from back. It came from uh, Gary Peltola out of Thunder Bay. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's kind of it's nice to have the history on it. And then uh, the other, the MXA, that, uh, the one in the corner was uh, 2005, the last year of the uh, 800 um, in Snowcross. So see, uh, yeah. that, that was my son's last sled. I kept it just uh, as a memento. And then uh, you see the Elite up in the, I have a couple of them. I got one at home. I drive around right now on the ice. Wow, that must be fun. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of a hoot to, to play with. And then uh, the Can-Am, uh, Mike gave me the, the Can-Am uh, motocross bike. Nice. Is that late 70s? Yeah, around 74. I 74, believe. okay. And then uh, my Millennium... Uh, uh, Emmett, uh, Mox Ed. The, the Alpine. Is that the year they had the thousand CC on the Moxie? Uh, no, eight, 800, that one. 800. Okay. Yeah. So, um, the Alpine at 68 Alpine, that's, that's one of my favorites because my dad had bought us one brand new when we were kids. So that was, uh, the first sled we had as kids and was always fun to drive. The electric start has the opposed 18. Yeah. Then, um, in the, up beside the, uh, 72, 340 blizzard is, uh, 2007 the last year of the 440s uh, i think it, that one has about 25 miles on it that's about it oh no kidding yeah and then uh the first year 2008 the uh, xp that's a 600 uh, xp mxz and then uh, i believe that's a 2007 600 sdi uh, yeah so and then of course the anniversary sled in the corner that, that, yeah. it's just fun collecting and doing that kind of stuff yeah you, for sure you now, do you have Go ahead. I'm sorry. You meet a lot of nice people, and uh, I've gotten to know a lot of a lot of really good people and a lot of good friends with it. Yeah, I'm sure. I apologize. My cell phone's going nuts here. I, I had muted my microphone there for a second to to keep it off, but it it uh, I wanted to respond to you. But yeah, please continue. So I'll just go back to the tanks to get uh, you know a good look. So uh, we're hoping to get interest in them just to get them out and get uh, you know uh, just get something back for. Uh, the uh, all the work in the molds, but really, and I, like I said, if it wasn't for Mike, we'd never be able to do this. Yeah, for sure. That's cool. Now, did um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to mute my phone here while we're talking because it's going nuts. Here we go. That that ought to do it. The did I see a um a uh, black dot on the on the rack there in the yeah. shop? Yes, there in an e, in an Elan is up there too, I think, and yeah. a blizzard, and a, a TNT. Yeah, seventy four uh, TNT free air. The uh, bubble nose blizzard, that's a 340 uh, right beside it, and a 71 uh, uh, 340 uh, blizzard also. Nice. Is it possible to get in a little closer on those? Um, I'll try to. All right. Don't trip or hurt yourself or anything. <laughs> if, if you can't get in closer, that's okay too, but I, I just love to see those. There's so much stuff in the store here, it's just hard to uh, get around. Yeah. I don't know. Is that a little bit better, Mike? Yeah, I'm liking that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder if you could tell us about some of those. Any any details or any stories behind any of those? Yeah, the uh, 340 was from uh, Kirkland Lake here. It was a, um, a local dealer here. And uh, so it's been around here its whole lifetime. I was lucky to track it down and uh, bring it back and restore it and put it back to the the, uh, the store. Uh, it's nice when you have the history on it. Uh, yeah. I Actually, uh, I remember going as a kid and drooling in the uh, dealership looking at those. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then that one on the far left, is that like an early 60s, one of the early production models? Yeah, that's a 62, I believe. 62, yeah. 62 tin cab. It's got the uh, JLO engine, that one. Yeah. And does it have the wooden skis or the steel skis? or Steel skis. Steel skis, yeah. yeah. Nice. And then to the right of that is what, an Olympic? Olympic. That's okay. uh, the 12.3. 12, oh, yes, yeah. Good. And what year is that Elan? It's a 78. 78, yeah. So. And then that's a free air TNT? A, yeah, 74, 400. 74. 
Very nice. Very nice. But that, that's uh, the three ninety nine, uh, the black dot. Okay. Yeah, those are nice. You don't see many of those. Would you like to uh, talk up the dealership a little bit? I know this is a family dealership. I wonder if you could tell us um, a little bit about the history of it and what brands you have and, and uh, anything you'd like to say about it. Um, actually, the, the dealership now is uh, owned by my son, Tanner. So mm -hmm. him and his sister actually work in the dealership, and they do quite well. Um, it, it's 100% uh, uh, BRP. So they sell all, yeah. all Ski-Doo, uh, Can-Am, Can-Am side-by-sides, um, as you can see, uh, all the different ones here, um, he, all the clothing. Uh, sea Dew, he also uh, sells. Um, he's he's big into uh, fishing, so he's got uh, a, a line of fishing, hunting, guns, um, yeah. um, uh, steel products. Um, I, I've got a, because I'm a logger, really. Uh, I've got a couple. Uh, thing. I got a, a vintage, uh, an old vintage uh, chainsaw here. Oh yes, yeah. And then even the chainsaw for cutting cement. Um, oh no, kidding. Oh yeah. So is that, a, is that a chain with a special type of uh, teeth on it that, that is designed for cutting through concrete or how? What, yeah, it's, uh, got car, car, it's a carbide uh, uh, chain. Okay, and yeah. You feed it with water just to keep the chain uh, lubricated and uh, cool and keep the dust down. Yeah. But uh, it actually works very well. So yeah, that's cool. we uh, got a real variety of, of uh, stuff and it's a nice, it's a nice uh, occupation and uh, hobby actually. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I'm more the tinkerer into the old stuff. Um, yeah. uh, one time we had a, a snowcross race team. That's how I got to know Mike, and we yeah. became very good friends. And a lot of the sleds, I tried to keep one every year of the uh, race sled. So I've got some of those tucked away, and, and that was a, a fun sport. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to have you on another time. I know that you've got another building there with some other sleds, and we'll have to have you on sometime and look at some of those. Oh, yeah. I've got uh, all different makes and models. Uh, um, I have a few Arctic Cats, uh, Yamaha, Rups, Snowjet. Uh, snow runners, uh, Husky, Diablo Rouge, you, you name it, I collect them all. Very nice, very nice. Now, before we wrap it up, do you have any, um, what, what would you say are some of your earliest memories of snowmobiling back in the day? Really, the, the earliest ones uh, was riding the old, um, or uh, being able to ride, uh, or get a ride on the old double tracks. Uh, that's what, what it was, uh, the early pre-1965, I think they were eight horsepower at the time. Wow, and, like the old Alpines? Yeah. And yeah, so, nice. Um, when, you know, when you're kids, you never had the luxury to, to, to ride the snow machines, even looking at them. And sometimes just being able to run on the pack trail was fun. Yes. So, did you, did your family do a lot of grooming with that Alpine that you had, that first sled that you had? No, no. We just drove it, rode it. A recreational sled. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, good. I'm going to put that graphic back on here one more time for a phone number. So if anyone has questions about those tanks or anything else that they see here in the dealership, um, that, that is how they would get a hold of you or to, with your son, Tanner, I believe. That's right. Wonderful. Well, good. Well, yeah, I really appreciate your coming on tonight, Joe. Okay. It was fun, actually. Uh, Mike, enjoyed it. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll have you on another time. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. Well, that was Joe Roscoe showing us his dealership, his showroom, and his tanks. And uh, we're, our next guest we're going to have here, let's take a quick look at this real quick. This is the uh, the menu for tonight's programming. We're on number two now. We're about to bring on Luke Bristol for a look at his racing sled. Let me get him on. Here he is. And let me get his microphone on. There we go. How are you doing, Luke? Good, you, Mike. Good, good. Thanks for coming on. Now, uh, now, Luke is uh, coming on from St. Johnsbury, Vermont, just about an hour from where I live up up north in uh, Derby Line, and uh, we're in his shop now. He's going to do a little show and tell on some of his sleds. And he's turning his camera around. Here we go. Let me put you on full screen here. So this is a 1971 EXT Special. I picked up like maybe like five miles down the road from my house. Yeah. I'm still looking for the person that raced it. They obviously raced it, but I haven't found anybody that knows anything yet. Sure. Now, have you raced it yourself or have intentions of racing it? Uh, no, I've had it run and I've driven it around a little bit, but I have, I'm probably not going to race it. Sure. Yep. Uh, it didn't have the motor in it. So I got the, I found the correct motor and the pipes and all that stuff. So it's all correct as far as I can get it right now. And then nice. we'll see where, where it goes from here. Nice. Yeah. That's a cool project. I like that. Is that a, a period, a period have... sticker, that AC sticker? Which sticker is this? That AC sticker on the, on the left side of it. Oh, I don't know. It's period. It was on there. So I believe it's period. Correct. I do not know. Nice. It was on there. Then the person that I got it from had a 440 hertz in it for driving on the trails. So oh, I see, yeah. they used to just drive it on the trails. 
Got you. And then you replaced it with this. Next... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. I put the right motor in it. Yeah, that's cool. I like those Emily stickers too. Then the next one is a 68 Panther with a 372 Hearth in it. And it's got yeah. a single Montana pipe on it. Yeah, that's cool. I bet that sounds good when it starts up. Yeah, it, it, it sounds definitely good. And this one was only maybe three miles from up the road from my house. Yeah. Now, is that a fuel tank there on the side of the engine? Yep. 68s had the suitcase fuel tanks. And then 69, I think they went to the trunk. In the Okay, yes, I remember those. I believe. Yeah. Now, is that suitcase tank removable so you can take it take it to a gas station to go fill it up and then bring it back to the sled and, and hook it on? Or? Yep, you can take it right out. Yep, you can take them right out. That's actually a cool idea. Yeah, I don't know why they switched to the trunk because they all just rusted out anyway. Yeah, yeah, because we had a '69 Panther back in the day with a with a fuel tank in the trunk. It had excellent traction, but boy, if you got that stuck, that was really heavy trying to yank on that. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And then I have a '70 Motoski SM634 that was Frank Scott's race sled from Maine. Yeah, I guess he was a big Motoski dealer down yeah. there. Yeah. Nice. So this has some racing history. Yep, this has race history. Uh, I had the motor, I took the motor apart, resealed everything, and it's all finger ported. The crank's been welded and banded. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ported pretty heavily, and it is definitely loud. I bet it is. Yeah, I like those pipes. <laughs> have you had a chance yeah. to drive it? Is it? Does it have some? Uh, does it have some get up and I go? Have, when I you... have driven. I, I do. Yeah, I do drive this one. Yeah, this one goes pretty good. I bet it does. Yeah. How does that handle? How does it slide like that handle? Uh, not good. No. Definitely doesn't handle the best. So it took a lot of body yeah. English to race a sled like that, I imagine. Yeah, definitely. It is one long sled. I think I could fit all my kids on this sled. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> and then this is the sled I race still to the day. Uh, 194 hour hertz in it. And it's also got a full, it's a 73 links with a full rubber track conversion. So it's full rubber track, clip track. And then we race this in Lancaster, Lisbon, Maine. We go, we do pretty good with them. Yeah. In fact, I've seen you race that. I've seen you win on that too. Yep. Very cool. In fact, you were yeah, riding that the, the day good. we met. The first first yep. time we met a few yep. years ago, you yep. were riding that. Yep. I remember coming off the track and you were standing right there. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And I just happened to have the camera rolling too. Yep. In a few minutes, I'll roll that video too when we're, when we're finished here. But, but yeah, tell me about how you got into racing. Yep. How long have you been racing? Ah, uh, not that long. You know, one of my buddies was doing it. One, uh, Ryan Peterson has the same sled as this. We have two of these. And he yeah. started racing years ago, and then he got out of it. And then I went to go watch him race one day in Lisbon. I was like, hey, I'm going to get into this. And we built two matching sleds. So these are identical sleds. Identical. And wow. then, so I've only been racing uh, 2017 or 16, somewhere in there is when I started, I think. Yeah. Very nice. And you're hooked at this point. There's no turning and back, then, I imagine. Yeah, well, there's probably no turning back. I got too many parts for it now. Nice. Nice. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Uh, a 76. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I got so many parts to that motor, I couldn't even, I couldn't afford to get out of it now. <laughs> and then I got a 76 340 snow twister. Very nice. This is definitely a fun sled. Yeah, I'll bet it is. Those won a lot of races back in the day. Yeah, I think hey. they still do very good to, to the day, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's a really nice shape, too. Yeah, it's not bad. The tunnel's been welded in the back, like typical. They always are. Yeah. But this one was only maybe uh, eight miles from the house. <laughs> I don't travel very far for these. Wow, nice. Yep. Yeah, that's really that's a sharp-looking sled, uh, too. They really the look nice. Jet, yeah, then the Thunder Jet, I picked up maybe 20 minutes north of here in a barn. Mm -hmm. And then it came from the person I bought it from. Got it from Burlington. They got it from right out of Burlington, maybe in the '80s, I believe. Okay. But that one's fun. I take that out on the track every once in a while. Nice. I've seen you uh, bring that to shows. I think I saw you riding that at the Washington show a couple of years ago. Yep. Yep. I bring it to the shows and I'll ride it around. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. A, that's a good that's a fun sled to ride too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. And then you said you do some uh, some fabrication of some I think engine mounts, I think you said, right? Oh, yeah. For uh, the race sled, for my race sled, I've been making uh, 194-hour aluminum motor plates. Or I'm in the process of doing a run of them right now. 
Um, I'm thinking I can do like pricing wise. I'm thinking like 80 bucks, I think shipped anywhere in the U S is what I'm thinking on these, but I'm yeah. still working on them. They're still in motion right now, but they will be available soon. Hopefully. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. In fact, I'm going to put your number yeah. on the screen here. So if someone is watching this and is curious about that, this is how you'd get a hold of Luke to, uh, to speak to him about it. Yep. Yep. Good deal. And I'll, I'll take that off. But yeah, yeah, please continue. Um, I got, what else do I got to show you? I got a four cylinder King Cat block, new old stock one that I'm wow, looking yeah. for pirates for, but yeah, that's impossible to find. That is cool. That is very cool. Yep. And then, uh, what else do I got? I got, so these are all like, uh, for my race sled, this is all my her 194 hour cylinders that I got extra for. Yeah. So backup parts and then backup parts. Racing, the backup you know parts. how racing goes. You Absolutely. Yeah, yep. And if I had lights in my barn, if I had lights in my barn, I could take you out there because I got more stuff out there, but I'd have to wait till daytime. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to have you on another time. Yep. Yeah. That's really cool. Yep. And these are the kids sleds. Yep. Now do your kids race those or do they just ride those recreationally or they do. They, they race these. This one is a, uh, this one's got a 206 Briggs in it that's uh runs on methanol. Methanol, yeah. So they all look the same. But, yep. And then the green one is a champ motor that runs on uh, C14. Okay. And the kids enjoy that? Yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They ride more at the house than they do anywhere else. End up yep. wrecking each other all the time. <laughs> Demolition Derby? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Nice. Now I know when we were speaking, you mentioned your day job is the uh, you have a powder coating business. Do you feel like talking that up in case anyone's yeah, in the area that would like to avail themselves of those services? Yeah, we uh we have uh, performance powder coating right in St. Johnsbury, right at the uh, in the Fairbank Scales building. Okay. We have we have an oven. We do a lot of race car chassis, like quite a few a year. We have an oven that's eight by eight by sixteen. So we can do pretty big stuff. Yeah, you can get a, get a big item in there, a vehicle probably. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Well, cool. Any any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Or I don't believe so. I think we're. I think I wrapped everything up that I got in my shop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is really cool. I appreciate you coming on, Luke. Yeah, not a problem. Good deal. Yeah, we'll um, yeah, we'll have you on another time to look at that uh, the items in that other building sometime. Yeah, absolutely, that'll work. Hopefully, I can get some right. lights out there. Yeah, for sure. Cool deal. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on, Luke. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Alrighty. Mike. Alrighty, take care. Bye bye. Bye. All right, we are back, and uh, let me adjust the screen here. There we go. So let's take a look at our menu and see where we are. Um, I've got a few things to talk up. Now, over the last week, a friend of mine emailed me uh, some information about a vintage Articat that he has for sale. I'm getting it on the screen here. Uh, Dennis Paradis in the state of Maine is selling these items as a group. And when I mean a group, this is what I mean. He's got the, uh, the sled and the little trailer there. He also has a couple of suits, a man's suit and a woman's suit. And he's looking to sell all of that as a group. Now, here's another angle of the sled. And of the cowl. So if you're interested in this, his number is on the screen. Give him a call. He's in the state of Maine, and he'd be happy to help you out with that. Now, also, I got another email today. This is a gentleman from Sweden. Now, he's he's looking for an El Tigre 6000 from 1981, and he's looking to not only looking for someone with something like this for sale, but someone who would be open to, to shipping it to Sweden. Um, so if you've got a sled like that, and uh, you're open to shipping it to the, to the country of Sweden, uh, give him a call. I've asked him to monitor the comments here. Um, so leave a comment for him, and he'll he'll uh, uh, contact you and, and try to make something happen. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention before we move on to uh, the induction of the in, into the uh, the induction of Claude Hebert into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame, I wanted to let you know that sadly, Crane's vintage snowmobile show uh, that's, that was supposed to be coming up on February the 6th has sadly been canceled. That's a real bummer, but we understand because with COVID and everything, uh, a lot of these types of things are being canceled. Um, but yeah, it is a bummer because that is a really fun show. I encourage you to keep an eye out for that next year. He always has it the first Saturday in February. So hopefully by that by this time next year, all this COVID business will be finished and uh, maybe we can all spend some time at that show. That is one of the, the funner shows in the East. So do keep that in mind for the future. So let's get back to the, the menu here. 
Let me cue up the video of Claude Hebert being inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame, but I apologize. I'm out of turn here. One thing before we get into that, I wanted to run the video of uh, Luke that we had on a minute ago. This is the video from when he and I first met. Uh, it's about a minute or two into this video where he and I met, but uh, let's take a look at this video. This is from the Lisbon Vintage Snowmobile Racing in 2018. Was this an 81 or an 80? 80. Yeah, I remember liking those. I was in high school when these came out. I really liked them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I really remember liking these when they came out. And then, of course, the blizzards came out there the blizzards, a couple yeah. years before. Yeah. These were snappy for the side of them. Yeah. And then a few years later, my dad got a uh, Citation 4500. It wasn't as sporty as this. It didn't, oh, have the, yeah. didn't have the twin car, but it was it was nice. You could hang the track out, hang the tail end out, you know? How long have you had this? Three years. Yeah. Three years, nice. Have you restored it at all, or is that original? Or? Oh, original, except the jack shaft, chain case. And we got a chain case was broke out of it. I'd take the motor off, cha changed all the chain case, jack shaft. And Wow. Cleaned it all up. Good hours in it, yeah. I'll bet, yeah. You now you're racing that today or no, just showing we, that? No, we ain't racing it. Just showing it? One always put a long track on it, but we never did. Oh, like a 4,500 track? Yeah, longer. Yeah, yeah that would be cool. Yeah. And then this is a 69 here. How'd you make it out? First. First? Yeah. Wow, congratulations. Thanks. Cool, what's your name? Luke. Luke, nice to meet you. You too. No, you'll probably see this coming, but were you using the force, Luke? <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Not today. You didn't need it? No. Nope. Nice. Yeah, I do a video magazine about vintage snowmobiles. Oh, cool. And uh, it's probably in the next edition. Sweet. Cool. What, what year is this? 73. 73, nice. Yeah, rubber track. No, oh, really? No cleats, huh? 73 lengths. Yeah, nice. Yep. There's a single cylinder? Or? Yeah, 340 hertz. Wow, nice. Good for you, man. You took it, huh? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Good. Is that new seat? Yeah. How bad was losing it? Nice meeting you, Luke. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Okay, if I take some video of your sleds? Cool. Yeah, I'll give you my card. I do a video magazine about vintage snowmobiles. I like that TX. Yeah, he's going to run it in the demolition derby at the end of the, end of the race. <laughs> nice. End of the day. Right, Tom? They'll probably do well. Those were tanks. We had one when I was a kid. It was we had a 250 TX, and it was it was tough. I was a teenager and it took everything I all the abuse I gave it. The only free as it didn't blow up on a regular basis was the fucking yeah. Polaris 250s and 340s, 440s. That was just a 76, Eight. 78. Yeah. Nice. That's all. It's not. It has been redone. All original, huh? Yeah. Nice. So we got original chrome plating and all that. So I bought it running. I think I'll just leave it alone. Good. So what is it, 340 or 440? Or? 340. 340. Nice. I'll put an Indy suspension in it. Double run of carbides. That gives us some bite. Oh, yeah. Nice. And I want it to ride the trail. Yeah. That sucker goes pretty good. It does. What is that, four? So was he just on the track or getting ready to go on? I don't know. What's that? Uh, what's that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Facebook one? Yeah, vintage snowmobile lovers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see your stuff all the time. Nice oh, to good. meet you. Okay, that's me. Yeah, I'm Mike. Hi, Mike. Nice My to meet you. Sweet. Yeah, nice to meet you. Yeah, I hope to see your stuff all the time. Well, cool. Yeah, uh, I wanted to show that real quick. Uh, when I, I intended to show that uh, once Luke had finished so we could show that the video, the camera was rolling the day we met. But, um, but yeah, without further ado, let's take a look at Claude Ebert being inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame in 2019. This is Claude Ebert. <laughs> Claude Ebert, racer promoter, inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame 2019. Claude's exceptional racing talent in the early 1960s was noticed by a local covert motorski dealer who then hired him as their driver. He was soon invited to race for the Eastern Motorski Distributor Rockwell Incorporated. It was here that Claude not only became New England sales manager for Rockwell, but worked closely with the Motor Ski Factory on engine development to increase horsepower and was involved in the many rule requirements for racing. 
His role in production, testing, and new model development, along with a full racing schedule each season, contributed greatly to Motoski's success. When Rockwell Distributor ceased as a distributor for snowmobiles, Claude accepted the job as New England's regional manager for Snowjet, now owned by Kawasaki Motors. Claude was soon promoted to na as national international sales manager and involved in, Gra in the Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he was involved in production testing, product development, and was involved in the development and promotion of the TOC Tournament of Champions. In 1969, on an icy Sunday morning at the Lancaster Grand Prix racetrack, snowmobile racer Claude Hebert, driving a 634 motor ski, got into a first turn skirmish with a Nata Cat Rider and delivered to the snowmobile racing world the first real glimpse of the element of danger to this sport. <laughs> Always be remembered as the guy who cut off a telephone pole. <laughs> You know, I never saw a pole. Because I thought I could use the berm and get around. My three-pointed smile was in a hole. So I was going up in the berm, and then I see all these kids and people behind the fence. I thought, oh my gosh, that's where I'm going. The next thing I knew when I came to, I was paralyzed, I was blind. And I thought, what in the hell happened? Somebody grabbed my foot, and... I could feel it. I said, shit, I'm not paralyzed. <laughs> so I was right between the snowbank and the fence. They like, pulled me out of there. I'm still blind. I turned my helmet around. <laughs> I still didn't know what happened. The pole was on the track, and my motor skis upside down on the fence. What? Uh, well, I never saw the pole. That was the most amazing thing ever. And then they got my sled out, and I realized, Tell my brake cable was broke. I couldn't slow down anyway. <laughs> so that was my day. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here and to accept this on behalf of the telephone pole and Wednesday. They took him to the hospital, checked him out, he came back that same day and started racing again. <laughs> I didn't go very fast, but my brake cable was still broke. <laughs> Claude, Claude is still promoting, though. Claude has been instrumental in helping us find these different racers and everything the last couple of years on the internet. Uh, he's, he's all the time looking for people, and he's, he's been very helpful. So Claude's always doing something for us. Okay. Thank Rick Stimulus for the work you've done in developing the site. And that has brought together so many of the races and names from yesterday that we had all along forgotten. And all of a sudden, the stories they come out with and the memories these guys have is just unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bruce Don't Bourbon, ask them what they had for breakfast. <laughs> Bruce Bourbon can tell you every race he was ever in and what position he was in. You know, who remembered that stuff? <laughs> but thank you and uh, for Paul Crane and you, Ed, for all the work you've done there. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Well, there you go. Claude Ebert inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. And I believe he's, he's viewing this tonight. I, I know I emailed him earlier to let him know we're going to be doing this uh, so he could view it. Hopefully he's on here tonight. Um, now, after the um, induction, I managed to catch him for a quick interview. Let's take a look at that. I'm Claude Ebert. I uh, started uh, racing motor skis back in 64 when the 65 models came out. And little did we know at that time what we were really into. We didn't even know that this industry was going to be what it is today. I think none of us really realized the industry was going to grow the way it has. If we had, and maybe we'd have done things a little bit differently. But in any case, uh, it was exciting because we were young, we wanted to go fast. And uh, when the motor ski dealer in Colbrook offered me a ride, well, you know, what the hell, it's this sled. You don't have to worry about beating mine up. And then I was pretty good on the sled, so then uh, I got an offer from Rockwell Distributors out of Yarmouth, Maine. And uh, so they hired me and I went racing and sales and raced every weekend and then salesmen during the week. Time went on. This was, I worked for Rockwell for about 10 years. In the first five years, racing and sales. And then after that, after the accident in Lancaster, they told me that I was too valuable to be on the racetrack. They wanted me in the office tending to sales. So from 71 on, it was strictly New England sales manager. And we had guys that were going to just race and beat the sleds up on weekends. So that, that was uh, my introduction to the racing and to the competition out in the field through motor ski and then of course Bombardier bought motor ski and things were changing rapidly at that point to where Rockwell was no longer going to be a distributor so I moved on to another brand and uh, never raced the other brands but was always involved with the other brands in one form or another of promoting, uh, developing, testing and things like that. 
So the snowmobile industry was very good to me for 18 years that I was in it. So today I kind of look back on that with fond memories, especially with what they have done here at Cranes, that they took the time and the initiative to bring back the memories of yesterday. I think great job. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, great interview. And I have to say that is one of the fun things about this Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame, the induction ceremony they have every year, is you get to hear these incredible stories like the one you heard a minute ago about hitting that pole and all the mayhem that, that ensued after that. Um, it's just story after story after story, not only during the ceremony itself, but as you're mixing and mingling with these people and, and over uh, overhearing other conversations that people are having, um, it's just an awful lot of fun. And it's growing every year. Every year the ceremony gets bigger and bigger. And it used to be inside Crane Snowmobile Museum, but it's gotten too big for that. It's just too many people. So now they have it outside in the parking lot. That's just how big it's grown. Uh, and I would like to cordially invite you to join us for the next one. It's going to be on September 11th, 1 p.m. Eastern Time at Crane's Snowmobile Museum in Lancaster, New Hampshire. Now, if you're planning to join us with this, a couple of things. You want to make sure you get there early uh, so you have some time to go in and check out the museum. You can also mix and mingle and visit with uh, induction, uh, sorry, inductees, past, present, and future. And you also want to be sure and bring a lawn chair. That's where you're going to be sitting, is you're bringing your own chair. Um, now, then they have the ceremony, as you've, you've seen clips of on this, this program. Uh, but after the ceremony, everyone moves over to the Lancaster Motel for the after party. And that's just as much fun as the ceremony itself. Everyone's mixing and mingling and taking pictures. And, and uh, all the inductees are very approachable. You can walk right up to them and ask them questions and hear some of the stories and get your picture taken with them. And it's, it's, there, there's a whole host of uh, vintage snowmobile enthusiasts there. It's just a whole lot of fun. Um, and if you're planning to go, you, of course, want to stay at the Lancaster Motel because that's where the after party is. As the after party winds down, you just meander over to your room and, and call it a night and everything is right there. Uh, but I, I do have to warn you, every year, the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame, all of the attendees and the inductees and everyone that, that comes for this, we fill up the Lancaster Motel every year. So if you're planning to attend and planning to join us and be a part of this coming from any distance, you want to book your room at the Lancaster Motel as soon as possible because we do fill it up every year. Uh, but I hope to see you there this year. I never miss it. And I hope uh, that you become a regular at this event as well. So I've got one last video for you. Let's look at the menu here. We are on number five. Uh, my friend Steve Dickinson. I see him at a lot of the shows, the vintage snowmobile shows in Vermont and New Hampshire. He's a great guy with a great collection. We're going to look at a couple of his Articats, which I believe he sold them. The bigger one, at least. The, the, the larger one, I think he sold. The smaller one, the kitty cat, I'm not sure whether he sold or not. But let, let's take a look at the video here, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Hi, my name's Steve Dickinson. I'm from rural New Hampshire. These are my three Articats that I have. Got a 650 EXT triple. They made 125 of those. That one has 2.8 original miles on it. It's been started but never driven uh, since I've owned it. And then we have a 793 Panther. They made 100 of these. Uh, this one was restored by Attic Restoration and their own personal flood. And uh, I purchased it from them. It's never been started since it's been restored. And then we have a little kitty cat that I made for my granddaughter to look like the EXT. It's got the uh, heads on the outside and the exhaust system on it. And, uh, nice. Kind of made it to go with my uh, EXT. Beautiful. I love these. Well, good. Thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Steve Dickinson's vintage Articat snowmobiles. Now, I believe he's getting rid of the EXT and the Panther, if I recall the conversation with that that I had with him a little while back. And, of course, he's not going to be without vintage sleds for long, so he replaced those with something else. And I'd like to have him on sometime for some show and tell because he has, as you can see from his collection there, he he, he buys the best of the best. He, he's got some truly exquisite examples of uh, vintage snowmobiles, mostly Articats. And uh, he's, he's also got the clothing and, and all sorts of things. So I'd really like to get him on here sometime for some show and tell. And uh, hopefully one day soon you'll uh, be able to meet him and uh, see what he's got. So that is about it for the evening. I really appreciate your coming on and especially the, um, oh, forgetting myself here. Let's go and look at a few comments before we finish because I know quite a few have come in. Uh, let me find where we left off. Okay, I think the last person we uh, heard from was Mike Orr in Ontario. And Mike Orr is involved with those tanks that we saw earlier in the podcast. Uh, we have Carlene Perry. Hey, Carlene. Carlene's my girlfriend. Thanks for coming on. J.R. Tozier. Now, J.R. is an inductee into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame, I think, in 2018. We'll uh, air his induction at some point as well. Thanks for coming on, J.R. I hope that you like what you saw and that you'll join us again in the future. Uh, Stacy and Art Fosler. Love the podcast. I know that Stacy and Art are regular viewers of this as well. We really appreciate that. Uh, Rick Moore from Brandon, Manitoba. Thanks for coming on, Rick. Danny Poitra, Poitra 
first time viewer from Belcourt, North Dakota. Thanks for coming on, Danny. I hope you'll continue to join us in the future. We come on, we're on here every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Tony Triafante, first time viewer from Aurora, Ohio. Thank you for coming on, Tony. We appreciate it. Our good friend Jim Layton is here from Northern Maine. Jim's been on here before, and he'll be on here again. I was just talking to him tonight. He's got some uh, new items he'd like to show us. So uh, sometime in, in the next few weeks here, we'll have him on. It's just a matter of arranging it. John Fitzgibbon, who has them in the USA? Oh, he's asking about those tanks. Um, and we're gonna, I'm going to get information about that so that uh, people can order them if they, if they need to. But in the meantime, order them or give a call to inquire. Let me see if I can find the graphic to put up. In the meantime, I know this doesn't look good the way I've got the screen laid out. Let me try it this way. That would look much better. But uh, in the meantime, uh, what I'm going for is that phone number at the top of the screen. So if you're curious about those tanks that we were looking at earlier, uh, that would be the number to call. Um, and, and they'll be able to point you in the right direction. Now, Ken Haberman is also involved with the tanks. He does the motor ski side of it. Uh, and that's how to reach him. Search for Ken's Vintage Rehab on Facebook. Kim Goccioni, Gooseland. Um, now, Gooseland is is where you get them in the U.S. I don't know if Jim is saying that it's Gooseland or if Jim is with Gooseland. I'm not sure how that works, to be honest with you. But um, Ken Haberman says, thanks, Joe, for the help. Mike Orr. We've got um, Michael Cotgrave, Cochrane, Ontario, home of some of the best trails in the world, home of the Polar Oval Race Cup. We also have snowpack drags, one cool sled museum with over 100 vintage uh, sleds to view. While you're there, check out the live polar bears. Uh, that sounds a great, like a great place to go, Cochrane, Ontario. So if you like vintage sleds and you happen to be in that area or going in that direction, be sure to stop in and check out all the snowmobile things they have there. Jeff Nix, uh, wondering about Mach 1 snowmobiles. Oh, he must have been asking uh, when Joe was on. Ronald Parks, hello from Cortland, Ontario. From I keep mixing up Ontario and Ohio tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, Jeff Nix is here. Oh, Ken Haberman likes that SM. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. John Greenwood, remembers a friend and a Zephyr. That whole neighborhood could ride uh, one longer. Diane Baker is on. Diane Baker is a regular viewer. Thanks for coming on here every week, Diane. We really appreciate it. Nice to see you again. Uh, Brody Messner messaged you five minutes before it started. Wanted to know if you could share that snowmobile event on your page. And unfortunately, I don't have a way to access that. I apologize, Brody. Um, hopefully, it hasn't happened yet or won't until next week. I'll try to air that next week. Uh, sorry about that. Now, Brian Robillard is talking about a vintage snowmobile show in Ossipee, New Hampshire, January 30th at Hobbs Brewery. And I think I have a graphic for that. Um, yeah, so here's the graphic for that. Saturday, January 30th, 2021 at Hobbs Brewery. Uh, if you're in central New Hampshire, that's a great show. And I know Brian is talking about maybe going to that show and taking some footage uh, to share with us, which would be really nice. I hope you're able to get some footage, Brian. We'll, we'd love to have that on. We'll give you full credit, of course, if you share some footage with us. Um, David Crawford signed in from Columbus, Indiana. Steve Dickinson, nice job. Thanks, he says. And that Steve is the gentleman who owns those cats we were just looking at. Uh, Pat Lima, very interesting. Again, awesome. Good deal. I appreciate your coming on, Pat. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, Lyndon Dewey likes the Arctic Cats. And uh, Ken Haberman says, very good show. Well, thank you, Ken. I really appreciate that. So we're going to wrap it up here. I'm going to show you a video about the Mad Ramps product in just a moment. But before I, we do, I wanted to tell you about something I'm doing Saturday. Now, I've been uh, in contact with my friend Mike Mayhar. He is involved with the Central Minnesota Pond Racing Organization. I think he's the guy that, that runs all of that and makes all of that happen. I, I ran a test feed of one of their earlier races from last weekend on Vintage Snowmobile Lovers, on my Vintage Snowmobile Lovers page uh, yesterday. I was able to do it successfully. That was just kind of a test, and I've had almost 10,000 views on it. So it sounds like it's a winner, and I appreciate you guys viewing that. The reason I did that is I'm going to try to do that live. I'm going to try to take that feed live Saturday. It begins at noon Eastern time, 11 Central. So if you've got nothing better to do and would like to see some ice oval racing, tune in. I'm going to try to bring that feed on on the Vintage Snowmobile Lovers Facebook page. Just uh, monitor that page, refresh it every now and then around noon Eastern time, and uh, you should be able to find that uh, the ice oval racing, Central Minnesota Pond Racing. So do look forward to that this coming Saturday. I'm going to try to bring that to you. It's the first time, and it's new technology and all this. And, you know, I'm in my late 50s messing around with this technology, so it is what it is. But I'm going to try to bring it to you, and if, if you're around, please uh, please take a look. All right, guys, thank you so much for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. Hope you'll hope you like what you see and decide to join us every week. I also hope uh, that you'll do me the favor of sharing this either on your profile, on a friend's profile who might enjoy it, or share it as a private message to help get the word out about the podcast. Anything along that line that you could do, I'd really appreciate it. It's a great way to uh, spread the word about this and, and help grow it. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful evening, and we'll catch you on the other side. Here's a quick video about the Mad Ramps product. It's the ultimate combination of simplicity and ingenuity. The newest way to load, unload, 
and transport your ATV or UTV. The MadRamps Pivoting Ramp System. Made in the USA and engineered for strength and durability. Maneuver through tight places and over rugged terrain with plenty of ground clearance. No licensing, no ongoing maintenance costs, and no storage hassles like trailers. Won't slip or move like conventional ramps. Free up more cargo space in the bed of your truck. Securely connects to your truck's receiver hitch. Easily extends for safe loading and unloading. Seamlessly retracts for highway and off-road travel. DOT approved in all 50 states and Canada. Quickly disconnects in under a minute. A unique space-saving storage system. The Madlands Pivoting Ramp System. Go farther. Go faster. Go safer. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs.